Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 23, Applying Embroidery Analysis. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome again to The Take Up. Uh, where I live, it is 2.30 p.m. in the mountain time zone here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, from the Embrilliance Studios, from uh, my office, rather. <laughs> and it is Friday afternoon, July 3rd, right before the Independence Day holiday for everybody, which will kind of come up as we talk about designs coming in shortly. But for right now, let's just say some people are off already celebrating their first day of a long weekend, and some people are not. They're in there doing it, hitting the grind and working hard. Uh, certainly, I am here for you for the take up. I wasn't about to break my streak just because we were getting close to a holiday. This is actually what I want to be doing anyway, folks. So happy to have you guys here. Uh, happy to be talking about design analysis, right? We're going to be talking about design analysis. We're going to be talking about how we employ the things we learn from design analysis also. And uh, I'd like to go ahead and say hello to some folks. Uh, who are going to be uh, in the chat. If you are in the comments, no matter whether you're on Facebook, no matter whether you are on on uh, YouTube, we can get into the chat. We will get into the comments. I will discuss things with you live. So happy to see everybody here. Let's go ahead and start. Uh, always says 9.30 must be a time lag. Actually, Frank, there's a time lag on my end. I had a little problem with my uh, setup and ended up lagging by a couple minutes. So I, I apologize for everybody. I lagged a minute behind trying to get things started today. Uh, Jeff says, hello, love the topic. Hello, Jeff. Happy to have you on. I know you love the topic because you were talking about it on your own stuff on MNerd. If you didn't get to see Jeff's stream, you should check out what he's doing too. Hello, Carol. Happy to have you on. Uh, Justin Armenta, digitizer himself. Happy 4th of July Eve. Absolutely. Uh, Christine, happy to see Christine here. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, happy almost Independence Day. Absolutely. Glad to see that coming. Uh, not a big fan always of the fireworks. Like to go see them sometimes. Don't always like to light them off, but uh, I know my wife does, so she's probably out picking up our big box today. Uh, and also, I like to see everybody's talking in the comments to each other, so that's always nice to be there, too. Uh, Donna, happy to have you here, too, Donna. Uh, Carol, love and brilliance. Yeah, brilliance is great. It's good to be in the studios. And we're going to talk a little about something I made in Stitch Artist for brilliance. We're going to talk about a free design that I made, and it's part of this whole analysis thing. Uh, and I have to agree with Donna here. It's a work all weekend for me. Yeah, me too. Pretty much, it's it's always a work all weekend. But at the same time, that's what I like. This is what I do uh, when I'm not working on actual stuff like today, working on fonts and assets for brilliance. That I'm happy to be working for you guys, working doing questions, answering questions for people, doing articles and the like. I've got articles coming out for uh, Images Magazine, and I've got stuff coming out for Graphics Pro. So I've got some articles that I'm working on myself. Sonia says, "Good afternoon." Uh, happy to see you there, Sonia. Frank, good evening, Frank, in the UK. And uh, Justin, what is this thing you call day off? I wouldn't know, man. I don't really have night off either. That's not uh, not how I operate, I'll tell you that for sure. <laughs> and then also, uh, Carol, hello. Uh, by the way, good spelling of my name. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm, I'm not here with the two regular guys, you know, on my other podcast that I'm a producer of, where I get called E Rich. That doesn't really happen here very much, but it does at least help you spell it, right? You're going to Google this stuff. And uh, Jan says, hi from Texas. While I could go on for minutes talking about everybody who does comments from right now, um, I probably will stop saying hi to everybody during some of the duration of the show. Understand that I love to see you guys here and I'm happy you're here even if I don't get to your comment. Uh, definitely something I don't wanna miss. Though I will agree with Carol here, we are obsessed, lol. Yeah, I don't know if I can laugh about it. It is true. I am obsessed with embroidery to the point that it is on me and with me at all times. I can't hardly help that, though, after all these years. But we're going to talk about a lot about embroidery today and about digitizing and analysis. So even if you're not a digitizing person, you're not digitizing yourself, there's still some stuff here for you to talk about. And certainly, like I always say, learning this stuff helps you to communicate with digitizers. It helps you to communicate with the people who do make your files and to increase your understanding and their your understanding and your ability to communicate. That's that's all we really want to do when we're talking about outsourcing. Best thing we can do when we're outsourcing is be able to express ourselves clearly and ask for what we want. Uh, same thing we're talking about our software or tools that we want or things we want to learn. Uh, really being able to articulate those things, uh, understanding things essentially, the essence of the thing, and we're going to talk about that more. Uh, these are important things for us to be, become better at our craft, and I think uh, there is quite a bit of merit there. So for and that's for everybody. I talk about this with uh, commercial folks quite a lot, where they're saying to me, "Hey, what's the, what is the gain? What is the bottom line reason to be creative and really great at your craft? To work on these things? To design more than you need to for embroidery?" And for me, it has been uh, customer retention and opening doors using the creative methods that I have used, understanding embroidery very well means that I can provide solutions to people and 
like I always say, embroidery is meant to be seen. Where in the commercial world, it's usually meant to uh, promote something. Well, what's the best thing you can do is catch eyeballs. You want to get people to look at the thing that you want them to look at or understand or promote. So having more creative treatments allows me to do that. Also, a lot of this is technical. We're talking about working on different types of materials. We're talking about using different stitch types and combinations, how to defeat the common stresses that are in machine embroidery, pull and push compensation. These things are understood by analysis, by testing. And when you break them down and understand them essentially, it means you can apply the things you understand to new situations. If you know what pull distortion is, if you know what push distortion is, if you know how fill stitches operate, if you know how satin stitches get narrower, get taller, if you understand these things and know about these constants technically, then when it comes to a new piece of material that you run and something isn't right, you're going to look at it and you're going to understand the stresses that form the design. I, I cannot tell you how many times I've seen the question, why can't I get a circle to quit coming out like an oval or an egg? Every couple of days, and this is me now for like 20 years, every couple of days, somebody who's digitizing says, why can't I make a circle a circle? And that's the thing. If you understand pull and push distortion, that in the angle of your stitches, you're always going to get pull. And in the angle of the uh, uh, perpendicular to that angle, where the stash, rows of stitches stack up, you're always going to get pushed. Things are going to get bigger in that dimension. If you understand that, you already know what's going to happen before it happens, and you can just adjust for how much it happens, right? These are the things we're talking about. So part of that, part of that is also getting creative. So we're going to move from the technical to the creative, and we're going to talk about what we can do. Also, like I said, the bottom line, we can react to those new situations. If you're talking about this creatively, you're a crafter, you're an artist, you're someone who's doing fiber arts, you're, you're making embroidery something creative for yourself. How do we get this richness of texture? How do we manage these different kinds of stitch types? How do we make new types of stitches that aren't just generated automatically by our softwares using manual stitches or stacking different types of stitches together? By understanding the interactions of stitches and understanding the stitch itself as a unit, you get the ability to creatively apply these things. A fill stitch is no longer just a way to fill an area if you can understand how to adjust density, stitch length, patterns. These things are all able for us to adjust and we can use them in different ways. Not to mention, if you can manipulate one stitch, literally one stitch, you can make anything you can see because the embroidery machine only makes one stitch. The only thing that it can make is a line from point to point that is the thickness of the thread. If you can get a hold of that and then how those operate when they start to stack together, you can make anything you've ever seen. It's all about interpreting art. It's all about understanding the technical technical needs of the material you're working on and how to bring that all together holistically with the file to make things happen. So uh, a couple of things we have here, a couple of comments, and I do like this one. Uh, Jeff says, it looks great in the software. Why did it sell out like this? Uh, not like I need to tell you guys this if you've been watching this show at all, but if you haven't, I'll just go ahead and jump out there. The screen is lying to you. It's nobody's fault. It's not the software's fault. The screen is lying to you. It wants you to fail. And I, that's the funny way of putting it. The real truth is uh, the screen cannot show all of the different kinds of stresses that would be on every kind of material, every kind of stabilizer out there. So what it shows you is what you draw. However, the file is never the product that we as digitizers are creating. The product we're creating is the embroidery. It doesn't matter what the screen looks like. It only matters what the stitch looks like. So ultimately understanding that we can make something that looks distorted on screen can make perfection in the actual piece, right? And something uh, Brian and uh, Brian, creative and brilliance has said that often. He says distortion and uh, you know distortion of the screen is perfection uh, in the stitch. And I, I say that in something similar as well when, we, when I teach. But that's the thing, if it looks great in software, in fact, here's the deal. You have two edges of two things that line up great in software in embroidery, two objects, and they line up perfectly edge to edge. They will not line up when you stitch. If it's perfect on screen, it's trash on the machine. If it's perfect, on the machine, likelihood is it's controlled distortion 
on the screen. So I always love to talk about that, folks. And uh, Jeff says, he's actually making a comment about an article I'm going to talk about a little bit. Are you wearing your shirt you repaired in embroidery? No, I'm wearing a very close facsimile. I actually bought a couple of this same shirt, and I'm, I'll show that later. So I'm going to show an article where I, I actually have a piece, and I shared it in my social media today, where I repaired a shirt with embroidery. And I'm actually going to show that article today as part of what I'm talking about. And uh, yes, it looks very much like this shirt. <laughs> One of my favorite shirts, and hence why I bought two of them. I like to think of myself like a character, folks. The, the Eric Campbell you get delivered is maybe not particular uh, the same as uh, the one that you might see privately. And I have kind of a uniform that I put on when I go out. It just makes it easier for me. Uh, button shirt hat goes on and I am ready to be Eric Campbell on screen. But it does mean I'm like a video game character. You get a couple of different palette swaps of different colors, but I pretty much wear the same thing all the time. Keeps me from making that decision when I need to be making other decisions, right? So yeah, no more decision fatigue. I just wear the same stuff all the time. Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> Diane says, good afternoon. So I'm talking about comments. Good to see you in here, Diane. And Frank, uh, boy, it makes me fail big time. Yeah, the screen is a liar. The screen always makes you fail. If you trust the screen too much, you will fail. You have to be able to interpret for yourself. When you're looking at what is on screen, you have to think about the processes that are happening on in the hoop, on the embroidery machine, and translate for yourself. If a satin stitch is this wide, I know that on this material, that's going to be a little bit smaller. And then you start to get a feeling for understanding that. That's part of the design analysis thing. But let's go ahead and start talking about the actual topic here. I mean, we've discussed it a bit, but let's get into the topic in a real way. So we're talking about first what? Analysis. That, that's the first core thing, right? We're going to talk about design analysis a little bit. When I say design analysis, what are the things that I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about looking at a design and trying to understand how it's put together so that we can replicate it. And we're going to talk about applying that in a moment, but briefly we'll define this analysis. There's a few different kinds of analysis we can get into, right? And let's, I'm going to bring in on screen something that I'm talking about. And we'll go ahead and add this to the stream here. I'm going to bring this down. We're going to pop up this particular article. And it's something that if you want to take a look at it, I think it's uh, worthwhile for you to take a look at. We'll go ahead and look at this article that I did a while back in print where, and I'll go ahead and drop the link into the comments for everybody now so you can pop the, up that article if you want to. But what we're, we're talking about with analysis is a couple different things. Number one, there are things that you can just see, right? When we look at a design, we can look at this piece here and you see that I've got a grid underlay. It's a couple of uh, tatami style underlays, fill style underlays, whichever way you want to call that, that are set up opposite of each other, 45 degrees. And so I've got a nice little mesh diamond under this uh, tiger's nose and cheek. You can see that it's there, so I can see the underlay. I can see that we've got overlapped satin stitches in the cheek. I can see that we've got satin stitches being used for the uh, for the whiskers. I can see that if I turn on the stitch points in the face that there's some randomness set to the stitch length and that makes it look more organic. Whereas if I look over here on the left-hand side, I see a regular stitch pattern, which means that I don't have any randomness in the background in the actual road portion. This is a tiger that's sitting on top of a, like a piece of highway. And we'll go ahead and scroll down here. It's for a motorcycle lawyer group. Yes, that is a real thing. And yes, that's the uh, logo they did uh, that I put on this piece of uh, faux leather for them. But you can tell, even just looking at the design, you can say, all right, the stuff that I can look at, I'm analyze, say, what does this thing look like? Why does it look the way it looks? Well, I get the texture that I get out of the cheek because I've got overlapped satin stitches. If I want to get closer here, we can talk about how much they're overlapped. That goes into the measurement side of things. But first, it's just observation. You're like, okay, well, it's got an edge that's made of a satin stitch. That's pretty easy to see. I can see that I have a regularly patterned fill that's very smooth in this black road over here. I've got some satin stitches for these lines. I can tell that I've got more than one piece because of the different stitch angles. This is a curved fill that's in here. I can tell from the way the stitches are laid out. And there's one fill for the nose, there's different fills for the cheek, and there's a different fill that uh, encompasses the top of the head. And I can see that I've broken that up into several pieces. And we can start to see like, okay, I've got several pieces of overlap satin stitch that are individual elements that make up this kind of fur in here. And actually in the black, you can't see it as well on the design up here, but you can see it down here. We've got overlapped still uh, uh, satin stitches also inside of the cheek there in the black in the shading. So there's first the stuff we can just look at. So when we're looking at design analysis, the first thing is what? Uh, what we can see. The things that we can see that we can write down and say, all right, if I want a design to look like this, I want an organic looking fill that looks like the, the nose on this tiger. Well, maybe I need to put on some randomness to my stitch length. When I want to go make my own design like this, what am I going to do? I'm going to go into my fill patterns. I'm going to go into my fill stitch and say, I want the stitch length to be randomized by a certain amount. 
And I just keep on playing with that slider until it looks the way I want it to look. You just start by saying, all right, I can tell. Why does this thing look the way it looks? Well, partially because the fill stitch is randomized. Also, I look at the nose and I say, there's a little bit of shadow here and there's a little bit of a highlight and a shadow on it. I go, well, that very likely has to do with stitch angle. Stitch angle is what causes the light to reflect differently off of patterns of stitches. Well, I'm gonna make a curve that's similar to that if I have an object that I want to have that same kind of pattern or the same kind of highlight and shadow. So I'm gonna make a curved fill for that particular section. Or I'll say, hey, I, I see that there's a difference between the cheek and the nose. If I'm doing an, an item that has multiple pieces or panels and I want one to have a slightly different look than another, then I'm going to make it out of two different objects. Instead of making one big object for the entirety of the orange in the fill here, I'm gonna go ahead and make two objects that I can set the different stitch angles on two different pieces so we get a slightly different look to the light. So these are things we can see immediately. Things like stitch type, uh, things like a little bit of the fill patterns, the randomness. If we were looking at a different kind of design, we might be able to say, all right, this design doesn't have full coverage. It has a little bit of looseness to it, so I don't wanna go all the way to full coverage for the thread thickness I'm using. If I want it to look like this design, I know that it's going to have a little bit of looseness to it. It's not going to be full coverage, so it won't be, say, we're on 40 weight thread, standard. We're going to be at some distance. When we're talking about uh, density, remember that what we're talking about is distance between lines of thread. We're going to have it at something that is more, a larger distance or less density than 0.4 millimeters or four inverter points because that would be full coverage on just about everything. So we're going to look at this stuff, and that's stuff we can see right off the bat. So that's the first thing to know about design analysis. It's just stuff we can see. It doesn't necessarily have to be crazy or scientific. We're not getting into the hardcore stuff just yet. We're just looking at what we can see, right? That's what we're starting out with. Things that we can see outright that don't really take a lot of work for us to understand. The next thing we have are the things we can measure, right? This is where we have to have the file or we're gonna be, okay, don't get me wrong. I have taken a piece of real embroidery and I've taken a jeweler's loop and I have looked and counted threads next to a ruler and tried to do measurement on an actual piece. It's a lot easier on the file. So what we'll bring in here, and actually I'm gonna bring this in from the original article images that I used for this piece. Briefly, I'm just going to show you this here. This is just uh, an image that kind of shows you about measuring. I'll go ahead and take this banner down so you can see it. These are things we can measure. Let's say we're looking at this fill pattern on this particular embroidery design. We have this griffin, and we want to know how to replicate this fill. And we just want to know how dense is it, what angle is it at on the, on the design, and uh, we can find that out pretty quickly. All we really have to do is take two measurements, right? We're going to run in on this fill and we'll get into the measuring tool on our software. And I've taught you guys this many times, but you know, for, if you haven't seen this, this is something that's pretty revolutionary. You can do this with anything. Uh, we're gonna take two measurements. We're gonna go and find on one line of stitching, we're gonna find two stitch points. We turn on our stitch points in our software so you can see them. We grab a click and drag and we find out, okay, from this stitch point to this stitch point is uh, 2.56 mils. Probably then this fill uh, is a 2.5 or 2.56, 2.6 millimeter length on the stitches. And we also get the stitch angle, 64.83. The likelihood is a 65 degree angle at that point. If it's a curved fill, you won't get that. You're just gonna have to look at the curve and try and replicate it for yourself. But on a straight fill, you'll get an angle. You can now replicate that. Then we measure from one line of stitching across a second to the third. And that's our density from one line over the second to the third, click and drag across that, and we're gonna get our density. What do we get? This says 0.4 millimeters, so that's obvious then. It's four embroidery points or 0.4 millimeter density. Those two measurements will let you understand any fill you've ever seen. So that's the thing we do for measurement, right? Same thing can come up, and honestly, I'll go ahead and just bring that image back up. I don't have to show it to you in a real detailed fashion, but let's say we were looking at these wings in the back end, or let's say we're looking at the face of the tiger and we're looking at those overlapped uh, satin stitches, we can measure from the edge of one satin to the edge of the satin that's underneath it, and we can see how much overlap we're getting, and that'll tell us how much overlap we need to get the kind of uh, texture and co continuity so we don't have any breaks in the design we're looking at. And we can find that stuff out with measurement. That's the kind of thing where we can actually measure it and get numbers, and then we, when we want to apply that, we enter those numbers into our digitizing software so that we can replicate the fill in that way. We enter that density, we enter that stitch length, we have that angle set in the same fashion. And then what you should get is a reasonable facsimile provided your stitch pattern is the same. This one is a standard tatami stitch or a wicker stitch, they're very similar. Um, if we have the same stitch pattern, we should have a very similar looking stitch when we're done, right? So that's, that's really what we're looking for here. 
measurement, right? That's what we're talking about. So things we can measure, stuff like that. We can actually measure fill stitches and find out what they are. And actually, let's bring this into, because I'm teaching this yet again, I'll just bring this up as well. Same thing goes for satin stitches, folks. If you want to measure the satin stitches density on the edge of a satin stitch, you can measure point to point. Or if you had chisel points on a fill, it does the same way. Measure point to point and you'll get that 4.4 mils if this was a four point embroidery uh, standard full density fill, that's what you get a satin stitch. But if you look at the middle of the satin stitch, it's the same way as the fill. Measure from the center of one line across the second, the angled return to the third, and that's going to give you your density on a satin stitch. So that's the stuff, right? I know we talk, we said we're going to talk about applying analysis, but I thought it makes sense to go ahead and talk about what we can see and what we can measure. So that's what we can measure. The stuff we can actually look at and measure overlaps, we can measure stitch lengths, we can measure um, compensation as well. If we talk about pull compensation, you'll have things like uh, where you're looking at the end of a satin stitch that is outlined by a straight stitch, and we can look at the end of said satin stitch and how much gap is between the end of the satin stitch. We know the satin stitch is going to push. If these are stitches, you know that it's going to push toward the open ends. How much gap is there between that and the straight stitch outline that goes around it in a second color. That gap is another measurement we can have and that help, tells us a little bit about push compensation. We can do the same thing. We have our satin stitch here and then we have an outline that's on top of it. And you'll see the stitches stick out a little bit on the one side. Well, we also have that reveal, that's pull compensation. We can measure how much it is out. If that design, when we run it, meets that border perfectly, but we can see on screen that it sticks out a little bit, we can measure that amount of the reveal and that's going to give us pull compensation. So these are the things we can measure. The compensation, the overlaps, we can measure stitch length, angle, and that's all about getting these interactions understood, right? So that's the thing. When we're talking about analysis, we're trying to understand these interactions between stitch types, and we're also trying to understand things that happen to specific designs, right? On specific materials. Part of the other things we can kind of measure, if you want to call it measuring, it's not something that's necessarily uh, something you're going to measure specifically, but you can. You can take a real ruler of the real world and your software ruler, and you can compare the design to the stitch out. And this means that you can now do comparisons on different materials. If you take the same design and run it on three different materials, and you can see that the pull compensation amounts, the pull distortion is different on each one, now we can use that kind of compensation amount as a good baseline for the alteration we would do for each type of material for a design. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about interactions here. So there's multiple kinds of interactions we're going to test, right? We're going to test combinations. So when I call say combination testing, there's two different kinds of combination testing we can do. So let's say we've done our analysis. We've got some settings there we want to work with and we want to do a wide range of testing, right? Let's say we're going to work on that. There's two different kinds of testing we're going to do. And actually, let's start with the most, the simpler one, swatch testing. Let's talk about swatch testing really quickly. Swatch testing, I think, is probably the baseline of testing that everybody needs to start with. And that is uh, testing small swatches of stitches at the setting that we intend to work with, right? And this is something I did from literally like day one of my embroidery career. To pr prove that, I actually have a, p a swatch that was saved from, uh, it was damaged in a flood. So if it looks terrible, uh, trust me, it's because it is stained from being damaged in a flood. And yes, there's a little tag on there, FS1. Why was that FS1? It's Phil Stitches 1. I literally went into my software and tried everything I could figure out with the different patterns. And I made swatches like this and they were all over the wall of my digitizing station. All I did was make little one inch squares, and I still do this to this day, little one inch squares that showed me what it would look like at different patterns, at different stitch lengths. And what I did with this is I had my file name that was tagged to the same name as this. Some of these cards, I actually pasted these up on cards that had the settings listed next to them on some of them. Other ones, I just had this file name and I knew that if I had the file name and I had the orientation, so I knew where each square was supposed to be, I could look up a swatch and say, this is what these settings look like. These are This setting pr produces stitches that look like this. Swatch testing is making these little swatches and saying, okay, I'm gonna tweak with the settings. I'm gonna tweak the underlay. I'm gonna tweak the density settings. I'm gonna tweak the pattern. I'm going to tweak the randomness and look at what happens. Stitch it out on fabric and look at what happens. Swatch testing is usually about things like texture. Certainly you could do rows of satin stitches and end up looking at just pull compensation and push compensation or the distortion on each side. And you do these on different materials when you're doing something like pull and push compensation because the material interacts with it. But the thing to understand about swatch testing is you are going to make sure that you 
have a file that you can refer back to and you'll have to be able to understand the orientation of the swatches. So it's very uh, important to label these correctly if you're gonna use these to try and set your settings. The thing is, once you have this in your hand, you can say, if I want one of these patterns again, I can refer back to my original file, look up my settings and say, those are the patterns I want. Swatch testing is the fast way to do that. The other way to do that is to have a library of your designs or designs that you love and, and do the design analysis again. Go back and look at those designs and analyze them. Truthfully, I like to compress all that and then make swatch tests like this, especially back in the day, it allowed me to then make a palette of settings I could then apply. When I go to fill a new object in my own design, I can say, you know, I remember this piece right here. I really loved the texture I had here. What were those settings again? I go look at the file for FS1 on that sample and I would say, here are my settings. And this was done in my original DOS-based software. It was horrible. We'll talk about that again later, but suffice it to say, I made swatches from moment one. I would still do that to this day when I'm testing something. And to show that, I'll show a fairly, uh, a more recent test. I'm actually gonna bring this up on screen real quick. This is a more recent test. I did this in an article about design, uh, designing for productivity. And because you guys usually do like to see the articles and posts that I put up here, I'm gonna go ahead and drop this into the commentary right now, into the comments. Uh, this Digitizing for Productivity article, I was talking about density. And this is one of the good ways to look at swatch testing. And this is uh, one that wasn't artistic. Remember, I showed you the previous one was textures. It was something artistic. So you can use it for uh, talking about creativity, things like this. But this is the deal. You run these swatches out. And this one is for density. This goes from full density to about half density. Down in this corner is full density. Up here at the upper left hand is about half density. And if you look at this, this swatch here on the bottom left hand corner, I decided on this particular project on this combination of fabrics and colors that this swatch here has enough coverage for me on the bottom left hand corner as compared to the one on the right hand side. So here's one of the things that I've ended up doing. I use this level of density. What does that do for me? 18% less density in my fills for that round of designs. That means the designs ran quicker, that means uh, less time on the machine. It means a nicer hand on the garment. And in general, it means that I just don't spend as much uh, thread time trouble running those designs. All of that's due to swatch testing. So yes, it affects bottom line commercial folks, artistic folks. Yes, you can use it to do things like testing your swatch patterns, testing your styles and textures. Great idea to do swatch testing. It's awesome concept. And actually I'm gonna bring in a comment from uh, Brian Bailey here. And let's drop all these banners and stuff off for a second so we can see our comments. A uh, great thing many of us have done, but I've never got to finish the project as I wanted. Uh, run those on various fabrics and stabilizers. The scientific method would be best, but who has time? Uh, Eric and I have long planned to do it and scan the results for everyone to see. It's on the to-do list. Absolutely it is. Uh, early on in my career, I did a different type of testing. We're going to talk about combination testing here shortly. And it's where I took the different combinations of stitch types and ran them out on a bunch of different materials. And I really did have a set of swatches. It was everything from... Uh, twill, I had twill, piquet polo, uh, polar fleece, or you know, a micro fleece, depending on what you call it, of different thicknesses and styles, toweling. And I had run a set where it was um, two or three kinds of underlay with different combinations of stitch types. And it is something I have done early on in my career when I really was alone. I learned originally alone in a shop by myself with no, I didn't even have magazines at the time. So really all I had was the manual to my software and time. That's really all I had, manual to my software, time on the machines and materials. And one of the ways I got to where I got as quick as I did, I was in full production for a commercial, uh, a commercial shop in three months. And the only reason that was possible is number one, I was really young and I was an idiot, would stay up late for free and do all this work, I guess, so if you wanna call it that. I was uh, obsessed as we talked about earlier. And honestly, because I did analysis, like I'm talking about, I did testing, I did analysis, and it's the stuff I'm talking about now, I applied the settings that I learned. The first thing was I had designs from other people, designs that I loved, designs that I knew ran well. What did I do with those? I ran them on the machine. I watched them run in sequence. We'll talk about that again in a second. I make, took notes on how they ran. I did measurements inside of the software to see what they were doing. I measured the where the stitches were. I measured how thick satin stitches were, like how wide was the satin stitch. And then I measured on the actual garments how thin they were coming out once I noticed that they were thinning, once I noticed what I eventually would understand was called pull compensation. Uh, my original software did not have any automatic compensation whatsoever. Uh, so everything had to be drawn in, you drew your own compensations. Um, and so invariably, 
I did all this analysis. I started trying to take it apart. And as Brian says, right, the scientific method would be best if you could. Uh, that's the thing. If you could test in the actual environment that you mean to, testing on the garment you mean to, which I was doing, uh, sadly, because I was wasting garments commercially. But hey, we had a lot of, of messed up garments that I could work on. And that's why I always, I always tell people, when you mess up a garment, that is now an awesome test bed for that material forever. So I uh, keep that thing around and test things. But yeah, that's that's the deal. I'm actually going to go ahead and bring in a comment from Jeff as well on this one. The ruler tool, the ruler should be everyone's best friend. I use the ruler tool almost every day. Even if you don't have digitizing software and you just want to understand this stuff better, almost every free software reviewing software has a ruler tool in it. Find out where it is. And if you have digitizing software, you should be using the ruler tool all the time. There's really no reason not to, especially if you're trying to figure a design out. And we'll talk about this again later. The thing is, the first thing I tried to tell you guys about applying this stuff is to get those settings, write them down somewhere, and then apply them specifically to the same stitch type that you're looking for. But what you're going to start realizing is that there's even a lower level you can get to. Not that you're all going to make your designs manually, as I sometimes do, where I'll do things literally stitch by stitch when I want them to have an ultimate control, but that you can use things like density. Density is not just a setting in your software. Let me repeat that one. Density is not just a setting in your software. Density is literally just a measurement of the distance between lines of stitching in your piece. That's it. What that means is you can have an area and understand a density that is made up of multiple colors. You could understand a density like that. That is blending. You could understand density that's not in a fill stitch. You could be looking at multiple rows of straight stitches and think about the density, how much coverage we have. And what is that going to do to the look of the final piece? You can think about density as that measurement and stop just thinking about it as a number that you punch into a box. There's nothing wrong with the number you punch into the box. You're gonna to need to know that when you make your fill stitches, when you make your satin stitches, you need to know that number and it's important there. But start thinking about density as the spacing between lines of stitching. And then you'll start to understand when you work on red work or black work, something that looks like an engraving and you're starting to find all these little lines and you'll look at it while you're digitizing and say to yourself, okay, I can see my grid. I set out a grid in my software so I can see the spacing between everything. I have a measured grid that I'm working on top of. I'm starting to digitize all these little lines and engraving. Well, those are getting pretty close together and you look at them and you realize if I run two lines of stitching here and then two lines back and forward here and I keep going like this, it's going to make a fill stitch because I can tell the distance between these isn't far enough apart for me not to cover everything because I'm getting too dense. Eventually, if you start to understand stitches as the essential thing that they are and you understand the essential nature of embroidery designs, you won't just be punching in numbers that you read off of somebody else's design, you're going to be looking at the actual stresses in the fabric. You're going to be looking at how stitches interact. So let's talk briefly again about another type of testing. Before we go further on into that, let's talk about combination testing. And this is something that I'm not necessarily going to be showing a bunch of images for. I don't think it's necessary. The thing to understand is this with combination testing. A couple different things we're, that I'm discussing here. Number one, combinations of materials. When we're talking about it in a material sense, combination testing means that I'm going to be testing on materials. Like Brian said earlier, that scientific method of testing, we're gonna test on different stabilizer combinations with different material combinations. So let's say that we want to take a piece and we're gonna take our one piece of cutaway that's piece of medium cutaway is my base for most things. That's what I'm gonna think of as my base stabilizer. Well, I'm gonna test that one piece of medium cutaway. I'm gonna test it with a uh, piquet polo in cotton, A performance polo in, you know, in polyester. We're going to do a t-shirt with that jersey knit that has the vertical grain. We're going to do a piece of polar fleece. We're going to do light toweling, heavy toweling, and we're going to test satin stitches or something else on all of these things, or, or we're gonna test our densities and see how much cover we have, or I'm gonna test different combinations, including a color contrast. So black with white thread, white with black thread, different variations of color or different colors on black, different colors on white, on gray, and see what we can do with the densities. Combination testing is to take materials and different combinations of settings and test them. So that's part of it. We're doing swatch testing that, that can also play into that. But swatches individually as designs, they are a uniform 
piece of one type of stitching, right? The swatches that I showed you earlier, and I can bring that back up just to make the, make the point really quickly. Um, this swatch test, of course, is fill stitches. This is a standard fill stitch. The settings on the stitch length are not changing. And in fact, that's the thing to look at on this. Uh, on this set of swatches, the one thing that is scientific about it is that nothing changes across the board of swatches except for the setting for density. All of these swatches have the same density in their underlay. They all have the same type and stitch length in their underlay. The, they all have the same pattern. The only thing that changes on these is one variable, and that is the density setting on that fill. That's something important to know when you're doing swatches like this. If you're really trying to narrow down one setting and figure out what it does to the look of a piece, only change that setting on your swatches, and that's something that you can work with. If you change multiple settings, you don't know exactly what it is about the combination that makes the change happen for you. So if you're trying to do really super detailed analysis, that's something you might want to think about. But combination testing is a different thing entirely. Uh, when I'm talking about combination testing as far as digitizers are concerned, I'm talking about the interactions between different types of stitching. So think about it this way. Uh, we want to test, the, and I'm going to say the, the main three types of stitching. Let's just go there and say we have running stitches, satin stitches, and fill stitches. Those are the main three types. Are there other kinds of types? Yes, we have motifs, we have other things. But I think if you really think about it, those are the most essential combinations. The, the, I mean, the only type of stitches we really have are, is one manual stitch. However, the types of, of kind of combination stitches that we already use or the types of automated stitch filling we use the most are fill stitches of some kind, satin stitches and straight stitches, right? Running stitches. The first thing to do here is to look at combinations. What does it look like when I outline a fill with straight stitches? What is it like when I outline a fill with satin stitches? What do satin stitches look like together when they're overlapped touching, when they come together at different angles? What does that look like? What does that look like with every one of these groupings? Fill to fill, fill to satin, fill to straight stitches, straight stitches against each other, and that's just spacing and angles. What does that look like, right? That's the thing I'm talking about, combination testing, and then we can even abstract that a little further. We can add in, what does that look like on a garment? Because you'll find out that that can make a difference too. We can talk about stitch angles as part of that as well. What does a two 90 degree angle fills, like a 90 degree and a zero degree angle fill look like running into each other? Those, that's combination testing. And depending on which one is on top, what does that look like? Which thing is in the right sequence? Now, and you're gonna look at this and probably say, that is too much stuff to test, Eric, that's crazy. The thing is, if you're not going to test it manually or make swatch testing, that's cool. Think about these combinations when you're looking at designs that you're analyzing. Because invariably, even if you're not going to make chips of this that you're going to run on all sorts of different stuff, you're not gonna make little swatches that have satin stitch borders on things and what have you you will look at designs and analyze them and see how they turn out. When you do, keep an eye on places where different stitch types interact. Because that's going to tell you a lot about what you need to do, what you will want to do in your digitizing when you want to put a satin border on a fill stitch. How do I stop it from tearing that ro the rows of underlying fill apart? Is there something I can do with the stitch angle down here? Watch that stuff, watch those interactions in designs that you're analyzing so that when you go back into your new new uh, design, what are we going to do? We're going to look at that interaction and make sure it plays out the same way in our design. So how do we apply these combinations? Well, if we look at the design and we say, all right, I've got a satin stitch that is coming down at this angle. This is my stitch angle of this satin stitch border on top of a fill. And when I see that the fill is, is absolutely horizontal, well, it splits up at the top and it has problems there. But then I look at this other fill, it's 45 degrees. Well, this one's warped. I don't like that one. But if it's about 15 degrees like this particular person did, well, when this comes down, it only grabs a couple of lines of thread each time, and I don't get a di distinct split in that fill stitch on the top where they interact. Well, when you go to make your own piece, you're going to look at an underlying fill, and if you want to put a satin border on it, you're going to think, hey, what angle do they interact at? Do they interact right at that 90 degree where I'm going to get a split or can I change the angle of the fill or can I make a little bit of roughness happen on the inside edge of that satin stitch? What can I do so that I don't get this interaction where we pull the rows of stitching apart? Look at those interactions and you can do this. Like I said, you can do combination testing. Go ahead and set out, do a bordered box, a fill with borders on all four sides and change the angle by five degrees on each swatch and then look at what you get. If you do that, you'll be able to see how do the different stitch angles react to each other? What do they do in combination? But even if you don't have time for that stuff, 
analyze it and look at it in your actual piece. That's the way it is. So that's really interesting to do. And I actually, you know, this is this is very true, Brian. Uh, stitch length measurements are instructive too. Absolutely. Uh, I've been very surprised from time to time in analyzing designs. The way I got the fill stitch that I use for everything, and this is my basic fill stitch that I set up in every software when I first come to it, was actually off of a very old jacket design. I had a jacket design that was punched stitch by stitch, right? And when I say punched, if you guys don't know that, we're talking about paper tape. In the original shop I came from, we had a collection of designs that were very old that came off of paper tapes and were done by those masters of manual digitizing where they did everything stitch by stitch. And the way that I understood that, the way that I finally got a fill stitch I liked, because I hated all my fill stitches when I first started out. They all looked bad, they were too tight, they didn't look right. The way I finally figured it out, I measured the things I showed you guys, stitch length, stitch angle, and density on that piece, and I replicated it. And when I got to that, that was all starting out because I wanted to see what was going on with stitch length. All my stitch lengths were really short. The uh, manual that I had and the information I had told me to set my fill stitches at this really short distance. They were, uh, I believe, as I recall, they were less than three millimeters. And I usually use a nice four or more, four millimeter uh, stitch in my fills. And everybody always says, oh, I, my, my stuff's a little bit looser. I have a longer stitch. And that comes from this, honestly, this really old paper tape design that I loved. So that's a... Uh, that's something that I really loved, right? That's something that I, I like to do is measure. And honestly, we talked about this in other episodes. If you check out other episodes about analysis and about what we can alter about embroidery, we talked about this, that that stitch length is one of the things we can alter on every stitch type. Because even if the satin stitch length is width of the satin column, but on fills, stitch length and on straight stitches, stitch length is important to the way they look. Longer is going to be shinier. Uh, shorter stitches together are going to be pebbled. They're going to look a little more pebbled because you're going to get more shadows and high highlights. Uh, and that's something that we can use to control the quality and the texture of the stitch. So stitch length measurements, absolutely important. And okay, I love this from Sonia. It's very nice. <laughs> my spirit animal is a sponge right now. I can't get enough of this info to elevate my art. Where can we see a pic of the sample wall? I wish I had it. Uh, you guys have to remember the sample wall was 20 years ago. The sample wall that had all the little swatches and samples and a bunch of it was destroyed in a flood. We had a flood in my office that... Uh, crept up my wall and wrecked all of my stuff. This piece was mounted on a board with a ton of other pieces and uh, most of them were uh, molded to the point that I really won't show them anymore. I have found some of my original files from uh, the old software I used. So I may at some point run these again and I may reconstruct them because like I said, I'm gonna talk about briefly uh, reconstructing one of my oldest designs that people loved for in Brilliance. We did a, a giveaway of this design. So it's something that I would love to kind of show you guys in a minute. We'll, we'll actually get to that. You'll see me looking over here while I try and set things up. I realize I don't have one of my tabs open that I wanted to, but we will talk about uh, reconstructing designs. Unfortunately, the sample wall, Sonia, is lost to time. After all this time, uh, plus remember, when I first started this out, we're, we're pre-camera phones. Uh, we had to go get a digital camera or a film camera, God forbid, and take pictures for these things to exist in pictures. I will, if I find some of these things, I'll share some of these in my social media. So if you know, guys don't follow me on Instagram, follow me on Facebook, please do, because you'll you'll be able to get a, a hold of some of these pictures as I share them later on down the road. So we talked about the different kinds of testing. We'll go back over briefly one more time before we keep going. Uh, swatch testing is important. Do individual swatches. That's one fill stitch type or one stitch type rather, if it's fill stitch, it's fill all the way down and we change one variable on a, on each swatch so that we can track that. And I talked about how to do that a little bit. Combination testing where we test the different interactions between stitch types uh, when they literally physically interact with each other and what that looks like. One of those things is also angles, folks. This is great. Combination testing can also be for materials. Trust me, do a bunch of vertical straight stitch lines on a piece of twill and then do it on a piece of jersey knit and you'll see how they that a single or doubled row of straight stitch can fall right into the rib of a jersey knit, even on a fine t-shirt. So stitch angle and combinations can be important there. And then the next type is design testing. It's something I've already said. You test designs. If there's a design you know you like, you test it, you run it, you do analysis on it. But when you're doing your own design, some of the only way to really test this stuff is to go ahead and throw it at the wall. You'll find that fill stitch patterns look great in little squares, but sometimes don't look the same when you start filling an organic shape with them. So there is a point to making your own projects. When I say design testing, part of the thing I, I encourage you all to do, if you have access to a machine, access to your software, make some self-guided projects, make designs that you want to make and just try stuff. The first thing to do is let go of the fear of failure. You are going to fail, but that's okay. Failure isn't failure if you don't stop. 
The only failure you can have is if you don't continue to try and refine your process. That's the only real failure that there is. If you try something out and it doesn't go in register and it looks bad, are you going to get frustrated? Yes, you're going to get frustrated. Do I get frustrated? Immensely. I'm not fun to be around when the design goes entirely wrong. Does it go wrong? Yes, even now. The thing is, I always come out of one of those sessions with an understanding. Plus, testing something to the breaking point where it doesn't do what you want it to do is the way to really find the edges of the envelope. It's the way to figure out how things work. You want to break things. If you aren't occasionally causing your designs to look bad, the likelihood is you're not trying very hard to push the envelope and you're only using the settings you're used to. You want to push hard enough to break it. So yeah, design testing is good. Do some self-guided projects. Do some designs that don't matter to anybody but you and spend time on them. And it's worthwhile always because what you're going to get out of that, it doesn't mean you have to use that design for anything, that it's going to be something you put up. Heck, do stuff that you can't sell. It might even be the best thing is do some pieces that you literally cannot sell, things that you're not allowed to sell because you don't want it to be something you're doing for somebody else. You want it to be for pure exploration if you can. Self-guided projects are great for that because you're the only one who can judge if they go right or wrong and test settings out, test different types of stitches, try to make te textures. And like I said a million times, when you're trying to fill a shape with stitches, think about the different ways you can do it aside from just defining an edge and defining a stitch type. Think about multiple objects, think about the way you could fill that area without just letting the software fill it from edge to edge with one stitch type in one setting. Think about that when you do it. But design testing is the next thing to do. So. What else do we want to talk about with that? The next thing is alteration. When we do tests like this, the way to apply these things, get them out there, do the testing. And then, like I said, alteration, the same way you would do with a swatch test, do this in your design testing. Get your design, run it out, see how it works, alter something in it that you want to explore and then run it out again. Even leaving it inset with other things unaltered. Take just the fill out of this one piece and then change it to a randomized fill when it was a smooth fill before. Randomize that stitch length and then run it out again and see what it looks like. It's worth doing and I know it sounds like it's incredibly time consuming. It can be. Do small designs, do little swatch boxes if you can. Like I said, swatches are great for this stuff, but it's really worth it to take a piece that you start to understand and then alter something about it. If you feel like you understand density, but you're trying to figure out something about it, like you're starting to get a hold of it, Prove it to yourself. Say, I think that if I change the density in this way, I'm going to get this kind of look. If you think that, test your hypothesis. Get a design that you know already works. Take a piece out of that design. Replace it with a piece that you've changed with your new settings and run it and see what you get. Alteration and especially controlled alteration like that can teach you an incredible amount. And that's the other thing you can do, guys. You can take a stitch file, a file that you can't alter, rip out a chunk of stitches and digitize something into it and drop it in the sequence where it should have been. I've done it a million times. In fact, honestly, I did it a lot a lot because I would get a stitch file where uh, somebody would bring me some old file, old logo, old something that didn't work very well. And I would say, all right, well, it's an okay design, but the fill has got really teeny tiny stitches in the fill. and It looks kind of weird. And it's way too dense. It's too much of that three-dimensional density, too many needle penetrations going through, too many wedges driving the fabric apart. I'm going to use a way longer stitch type go into a stitch file, a DST file, rip the fill out, and then replace it with a new digitized fill and just drop it into the sequence where it's supposed to be. If you're careful, you can do that kind of alteration even on a file that you didn't create. Uh, so alteration is great for understanding that thing. Then look at the two files together. Go back to that whole idea of what can we see and analyze what we can see first, then do the measurements. What do we see in the software? What did we end up actually seeing in the thread, right? That's what we're talking about. That's how we apply education. And that's the thing too. If you have looked at stuff that I taught you in this series, if you've gone to somebody else who's taught you something about digitizing, never just trust what they do and run straight to commercial projects, do testing and then alter the thing they said and prove it out. There's no reason not to. The only reason is our time. And honestly, a lot of the time though, it's not the time that it really takes. It's the fear that we have of something going wrong. But like I said, if you are testing this to improve your understanding, the best thing you can do is to go too far. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying crash your needle into the hoop, commercial <laughs> machine users. I'm not saying wreck something permanently. What I am saying is some ruined fabric is not a waste. It's something that's going to teach you. And what you end up with, like I said before, is understanding the essence, understanding the essence of your stitch types. What are the things that change them? What we want to do first, like I said, measure, 
then we apply. How do we apply the settings? We literally make our own designs that have elements like that, like the element we were analyzing. If we see somebody's blend and we under we want to understand it best, the best way we can do it, start by doing all the measurements analysis. Then we want to make a new design that is not the same as the old one so that we can't just crib everything directly over or copy or paste or whatever. We take a new design that is similar to the one they had and then recreate it in our best fashion. Recreate a similar design and see if we can get there. Then, then if we have something that we're looking at that design and say, okay, I have something about that blend. It didn't quite work or it looks like the old one, but I think I could do something different. What if I changed this stitch pattern? What would it look like? What if I changed the sequence? What if I put the light color on top of the dark instead of the dark on top of light when I do my blending? Would it change something about it? Then we alter something. Then we go to alteration and we test our design and we start to understand. And what we start to understand is the essence of the thing. Like I said, with digitizing, even though we have these settings, even though we have a satin stitch, even though we have a fill stitch, we have motif stitches, we have whatever, we have gradients that are set up and automated to some degree. We have all of this stuff, but the essence of the stitch is the single stitch and the combination of stitches together. That's it. It is the length of the stitch, how the stitch pulls in, how stacks of stitches push apart, what they look like when they're a certain distance apart, what they look like when you run multiple passes of stitches over one spot. The essence of the stitch is what it looks like when you com when you combine it, right? So understanding that essence, it's like I said about density. We understand that density is a measurement of the space between rows of stitches. Instead of abstracting it too far and just saying density, uh, I'm not getting coverage, I need to make the density higher. Not necessarily. We can also think, okay, if what I'm looking for is to cover the background, do I need to bring the stitches close together or could I add underlay in a different fashion that might cover more of that background? Or if I understand that loft, that the distance from the background to the front changes how much I'm seeing in the background, could I just use structure to lift the stitches on top up? If we start to understand the essence of what we're trying to do as well as the essence of the stitch itself, we can start to make changes that aren't bound entirely by the settings that we're looking at. And that's the same thing too. Once you understand this essence, it means when you don't have something that works in an automated setting, you can use other settings to work on it. Now, if you have great software, like, hey, Stitch Artist has awesome stuff. Like uh, it essentially can do uh, stuff for 3D foam that I used to have to do entirely manually. And I mean, stitch by stitch, and it does it with a setting that you flip on. When there are settings like that that work, absolutely use them. The cool thing is I can also tweak settings that are meant to do one thing and use them to do something else. Because if I start to understand what the essence of the stitch is, what I'm trying to get out of the combinations, I can then use anything for anything else. I can use a manual stitch to build everything I want to. I can use a motif to build an underlay. I can underlay something manually with straight stitches or with other kinds of fills. I can make an underlay type that doesn't exist in an automated fashion. These things are all done by understanding that stuff, right? You have to understand that. So it's really great to do that. You edit, and like I said, you can edit things out, you can work, you can alter the things you have that exist to use that stuff. And um, got some motivation from Brian talking about editing stuff out. If you need motivation, think about runtime. It's rare that a stock design cannot be run with 10% or more uh, or less, right? Fewer stitches. Uh, if you need to balance your playtime and production time, that might help. I fully agree. Uh, understanding density is one of those things where I've never felt bad about working on densities or replacing fills in a design because honestly, most of the time they really are sometimes up to 25% too high. I, whenever I get a stock design from somewhere, it really is really 10 to 25% too high in the density almost always. And in fact, the other thing is a lot of the time when you're looking at things that have fine engraving style detail, especially the digitized by modern digitizers, um, old school digitizers had to, by necessity, work at a six to one ratio. They worked at these huge ratios on pieces that were marked out and they pre-drew these things so they knew where their lines were going to go. A uh, modern digitizer might take a photograph of something and zoom in on a blurry photograph and just start drawing lines. And if they're not paying attention to spacing, they're probably getting them too close. Almost always when you're zoomed in really high, you work in too much detail. Uh, because you're not thinking about this density and spacing. So it's something to work work on for that. So yeah, editing out the bad stuff and uh, adding good. There's some reasons to do that. But in any case, let's talk briefly about the other half of this thing I want to discuss, which were uh, designs that I, a design that I actually did bring kind of back uh, from <laughs> from before. And it's something I'll go ahead and show you guys the design we're talking about. Uh, this is on my Instagram feed and you can find this also. And I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to uh, <laughs> take the risk to actually go over to 
uh, a website live while I'm doing this. I'm going to show this to you again. This is the design we're talking about. Uh, I originally had an old design that I've done quite some time ago. We'll discuss the old version of it. This is the new version of it that I gave out on uh, in brilliance.com. And this is actually a Trapunto design. If you don't know Trapunto, it is a traditionally Trapunto is actually where you would stuff, you would pack the back of an embroidery design um, with something and kind of stump it up. So you had some, some density. Trapunto usually for what we mean now, you often I hear it called also embossing designs. It's usually where we're knocking down, flattening out a, a loft or smashing down Often it's like toweling or fleece or fur or something like that that we're smashing down with stitches to get a puffy effect. Um, this particular piece, however, was just done on a lofty piece of like French terry. It's a sweatshirt, essentially. If you have a sufficiently thick sweatshirt, this design will puff like this in the open areas um, outside of the stitching without any batting. This one, I had to buy a yardage of it, and unfortunately, it was a little too thin. So when I did the final sample, I used a very thin piece of uh, quilt batting that was between the cutaway stabilizer, there was a layer of thin quilt batting, and then there was the super thin kind of uh, French terry on top. It could have been t-shirt material. It could have been jersey knit if I wanted it to at this point, but I did kind of work on it that way. And uh, this particular piece was actually a resurrected piece. It, it came from one of my earliest fun time test pieces that I ever made. I redesigned it to be more modern, right? And uh, by the way, I like this. Brian, bring this in. This is not, he has TMI side note, but absolutely, this is not TMI. This is awesome. Thank you very much for bringing this in. Uh, Trapunto is the Italian word for puffy. That is the best thing ever. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> but yeah, Trapunto, uh, puffed up designs. And really what the essence is for machine embroidery now, modern machine embroidery, is that we have fairly tight stitching outside of an open area. And the open area, as you can see here, becomes puffy, right? Now, in this particular piece, uh, you can see, when you usually see people talk about Trapunto designs, what have they done? Generally, what they've done is they've made a fill stitch with a hole in it. That's almost always what it is. It's a fill stitch or a grid or something like that that has a hole in it, has a void in it. Uh, when I did this, and I'm not joking, 18 years ago, I believe, was the first time I did this design. The first time I did testing on these designs, uh, I, I looked at the very early embossing designs that were out, honestly, in the home embroidery market and thought, oh, that's a really cool idea, but I really want it to be multicolor and I don't just want one unilateral fill. I'm going to use straight stitches to make my own. I still like the effect. I want it to be puffy like this. I want it to stand out. You know, I want it to look like that, but I don't want... Uh, this kind of like just this grid of fill stitch and it's really cool because you can see it when it's running on the machine You'll see it start to puff up and you see the shadows on it super cool to run this stuff I love the Trapunto designs for this But the funny thing is I did this design I'm actually gonna go ahead and uh, I'm gonna pull this screen out and I'm gonna bring in software because we're gonna talk about how I achieved this thing and how I did it from my original design I wanted to get a similar look to my original design and I'll show you the original But I wanted something to be more modern design wise and I wanted it to actually be a little more dense than the original So I get a little more color out of it originally I had a mandate to cover this like eight inch square area or this eight by five area with as few stitches as possible. And I managed to do that with about uh, nine, 10,000 stitches. And that's what I did because we were trying to salvage these uh, sweatshirts and we were going to use these sweatshirts. We we're going to sell them into the market as like retail sweatshirts for patriotic stuff, Americana. And so I had to use the least amount of stitches possible to get these things through production quickly and put very little into them. We were salvaging them and they were a lost cause. Otherwise, these were going to be holding it on the floor if we didn't sell them. So the mandate was make a design that looks good, that has high coverage, that fits with the kind of ethos we're looking for, looks nice with the least amount of stitches possible. We're going to go into bonus time for me to share this section because I'm going to parse this out. This is the design analysis and reproduction section that you've probably been waiting for. So what we're going to do with this, we're going to go ahead and uh, share something different. I'm going to go ahead and share uh, an application window first. And we're going to start, uh, we're going to go ahead and start with a design software because actually I pre-designed the piece that I was looking for. The first thing we're going to show you though, uh, what the software that I'm in is not important here. Any vector software would be fine for what I'm doing, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you what this one is. This one is um, Affinity Designer. It's inexpensive. It's not exactly Adobe Illustrator, but it does a pretty good job. Corel Draw is fantastic. I use Corel too, but at the time I was using Affinity and because I can have it on all my machines and it runs pretty light, I just used Affinity. But this, what you're seeing right here right now um, is my original design, right? This is the design that I talked about first. 
back then, all those many years ago, this is the design I created. And I did this in my oldest software, the software that could not draw a curve. And I'm going to prove that pretty distinctly right here. But this is what it eventually looked like. Right. And honestly, that's not the great shot. This is the old shot. This is the shot that everybody has seen on my website. I just love those off angle shots. If you have not mastered the off angle money kind of uh, glamour shot where you have it at a slight angle and you see some of that texture on the embroidery, go ahead and do that. It always looks nice. And I love this piece for that. But that's the shot that everybody sees of it. Uh, but you can see this is the actual design front on. Uh, and it was done with a, it's a font called copper plate. I'm sure most, most of you know it because it's a fairly standard stock font. So I thought, you know what, I want to do a modern version that is not in a standard stock kind of old school font that you can find on everybody's old windows computer. I want to do this in a more modern way. Let's try this out. Everybody loved this design and I never sold it or gave it away. So eventually they're like, Hey, let's, let's bring this out and make this a design for everybody. Right? So that's what we did. And here's how I started. I started with the design that I did the first time, right? And so here's here's the design I did the first time. This is the actual design, but boiled down to like a transparent PNG file. And I'm going to prove to you how nasty this software was, right? Uh, if you look and you zoom in, we've got too many of these uh, panels open and stuff here, and I, I may have to mess with the panels and get that closed up so you can see more of it. But if you zoom in on this S, there are no curves in this software and I was not careful. I did not do this in a careful way. I could have used smaller lengths in between here, but I drew this all. So that design, by the way, when you're, when you're overly criticizing one of your designs, uh, think about that for a minute, that this, the original design looked the way it looked uh, with these horrible curves. It looked pretty good, right? You can see that it still looked all right. This design looked this good on the, on the actual piece, even though the, the piece that we ended up with in the file looks like this. It looks pretty rough, right? And if you're looking at it, I've got some pretty raw densities here. I'm not very careful about my spacing. I scribbled it in a way that I was trying to be kind of rough with it. But if you look at the way I did it, it was a little too rough. I had gaps that weren't working. And sometimes I had voids big enough up here in the blue that I was getting puffy areas in places I didn't want. Because what I want to do is make sure I'm not leaving too much room in between any of these colors, in between any of these stripes, because I want to make sure that I'm getting puff in the places I want it, but I'm knocking down the fabric in places I don't. And over here in the side of the A, I, was, I wasn't I was really getting it knocked down around the A, so I, I really had these gaps. Also, if you look, the red was too dense compared to the others, or the others were too light compared to the red, whatever you want to say. But if you look at the piece, I'm thinking it's a little too uneven. I want it to be a little cleaner, and I definitely want to replace this font. So let's imagine for a minute that this piece was uh, not my piece. And I, I essentially treated it like it wasn't because I couldn't look at the original file. The original file I had was long gone. I can't open that software. I don't have a Windows uh, 98 or earlier, a DOS 6.0 machine with a parallel port to run that software anymore. So I have to just go ahead and look at what I have. And the first thing I did was I looked at the stripes and I said, okay, it's a simplified version of the American flag. I'm not doing 13 stripes. I just want an odd number. So I'm red on both sides. So, okay, I've got these stripes here. I'm going to make something like that. I know that I have this field of blue in the corner. It's flag inspired. That's what I'm looking for. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a low resolution flag like this because I want to make sure I've got that background again. So I'm going to look at that. And eventually what I'll end up with is this. And this piece is just plain blocks of color. This is, it's not a real accurate flag. It's not supposed to be. I'm using this to make a scribble style design. Not a big deal. So I'm looking at the original design. I've done that. That's something I can just see. I've got a few stripes. I want to make sure I got red top and bottom. And I want to see about the size of that original piece there is, uh, looks like this. I can see that that's about the size that I'm going for. And if I go ahead and grab this and I drop the opacity out on this one so you can see what's behind it, um, you know, then I can go ahead and say, you can see that that's roughly about the same sizes and shapes that we had in the original piece. So I just laid that out there and said, that's the original layout. No big deal. I'm just going to make that flag and done, done and done, right? That's what we're looking for, but we're not trying to do any more than that. Simple flag there. The other thing I did do, however, we'll go ahead and pull that away and drop the design back in. I looked at the design and said, all right, well, I kind of like the density that's in here. I kind of like the density that's in the red. This is about what I'm looking for. So I said, all right, I'm going to try and make sure I've got lines spaced about like this. And what I did at first, I tried to measure density, but I looked at the stitch angles were all messed up. I was not very careful with my angles on this because I'm just drawing straight lines back and forth across the stripe. That's all I'm doing. So what I decided to do is just count and say, all right, what when I'm talking about spacing, I said, all right, well, I've got a bar. The bar is this tall. How many lines of stitching do I have? 
Well, if I'm drawing back and forth, I look and count and I say, that's how many lines of stitching I have. Well, here's the thing, lines of stitching per distance gives me the space between the lines, that's also density. So sometimes you don't even have to worry as much about the measurement. If I know that 17 lines of stitching inside of that line, if I make sure that I go back and forth and I've got 17 lines of stitching and that they're fairly evenly spaced, that I'm gonna hit the density I want, that's all I needed to know. So it looks complicated, looks crazy, looks scientific. All I had to do when I was drawing this thing was make sure that I counted off the number of stitch lines I wanted going back and forth as I went from the top to the bottom or from the bottom to the top, as it were. So when I'm doing the original drawing, the other thing is I'm not gonna worry about the voids inside of here because in the original drawing, I'm just gonna drop text on top of it. So let's go ahead and drop this out. Let's go ahead and look again at this in a more full way. Let's pop out of this PNG file that's just me looking at the design itself. And let's take a look at the actual uh, fullness of this thing for a second. So we've got that flag that I put in here. We're gonna drop this out. We don't have to worry about that. We're gonna look at the flag that I had. There's the flag that I've got. And we, we already saw how this is supposed to look on top of that, right? I'm gonna drop this back out so you can see the entire flag. Well, what I started to do is just go ahead and sketch on top of it. I sketched the different sets of lines. And all I did was I made them a little bit more regular than I did on the original. And all I did literally, I'm not joking, was make straight lines from one side to the other. And I counted out how many I wanted per bar. And I adjusted it as I was going. If I didn't like it, I reworked it. That's why I did in vector. You could do it in free vector software like Inkscape if you want to. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Also, I'm gonna tell you right now, we're not gonna use these lines as how we digitize the design. I'm not gonna pull these lines in and assign stitches to them. I'm going to draw those again. Go ahead and get over the fact that you're gonna draw twice or you're gonna digitize something because honestly, it's the better option is to draw what you need for embroidery. So we'll go ahead and say, that's what I started from. That was my design. Cause this is my original design. If you can call it that. I mean, you can hardly say this is much designing, but what I ended up with after I did this, right? I'm looking at this thing. I've got the background out, dropped the background out. And this is what I had. Not very impressive yet really, but hey, I also know that I'm gonna get an effect out of this. I'm going to get from the fact that I'm using embroidery, I get as a bonus benefit for free, the shine and sheen of embroidery thread. I get the puffiness of the Trapunto effect when I drop the letter uh, voids in there. I get the texture of the garment versus the texture of the shiny thread. So I get all of these things for free. So the design itself doesn't have to be that impressive if the materials are impressive and yes, they are. So what did I eventually do with this piece? I say, all right, I've got this thing at the size that I want the design to be. I kind of got the abstract flag I wanted. And after a while, the other thing I did adjust quite a few times, uh, the pattern of these edges here, because I did draw these manually, I adjusted how rough I wanted them and which uh, lines should stick out further and which should be shorter. And I actually adjusted it after I did the final step here, which is to drop in the text. And I used a nice modern, blocky font, very kind of uh, industrial looking, very retro looking. Uh, but I thought in comparison to that original copper plate that is like on everybody's list of stock fonts that are in their word processor, I'm, I'm looking at this saying this is a much nicer looking font. I'm going to have a much more modern look. It looks much more like a retail piece than if I just use some stock font out of my software. So I went and got a nice font from a designer and used that to plan my voids. And this is the art that I then brought in for digitizing. So first thing is I made the art separately. I think it's worthwhile to think about that, even if you're doing this. And by the way, I'm putting art in big quotes here. I scribbled some lines, adjusted their space so that it made, made a decent look for density, though I did leave some roughness in there, as you can see on purpose, because this is supposed to be distressed and vintage and look retro. So I let it have some sway in it. There's some gaps, but there are less gaps than my original. If I went back and showed you the original piece again, uh, you'll definitely see that the original piece, much more varied, kind of rough looking. And some of the points were just, there's too many gaps in there. And like I said, in the blue, we were getting puffy areas that shouldn't have been puffy because we had big gaps over on the right-hand side. It was a little too rough and didn't look all that great. And then when I got done with my sketch layer and to drop this text in there, much cleaner look, much more professional. And honestly, hey, I've got a lot more experience between then and now. That first time I didn't have nearly the, much, the amount of design experience that I have now. So I did all that in Affinity. You could have done it in um, Inkscape for free if you wanted to, or you could do this, this part of it in your digitizing software with the built-in line tools. You could do that too. For me, I did it in Affinity because it was quick and I wanted to visualize it all as a SVG file. And I did, I output vector, not because I'm going to assign stitches to it, I'm not. 
Now this one, the one thing you could assign stitches to, I'll say the last step is a backstitched edge around the letters. You totally could use your original vector to do that if you want to. And I believe I may have started that way. Uh, but the rest of it, I'm not gonna use these to assign stitches to. I'm going to use them as the basis on which I'll draw. So we're gonna go ahead and drop this uh, software out. We're gonna go ahead and take off that screen for a moment. And I'm gonna share another screen with you because we're gonna actually go back and share uh, Stitch Artist. We're gonna share this in Brilliance. We'll take a look at that. So let's go ahead and bring in, in Stitch Artist, the first thing I'm gonna show you is the original file. And we'll go ahead and run this out because it's something that I always think is interesting. We talk about sequencing. I'll go ahead and show you this old file. And like I said, this thing is ancient. You'll have to forgive me. There's tons of mistakes in it. But all it is is some scribbles. And whenever, uh, and this is also doubled, you'll see that I run everything doubled on this one. So every, every line is doubled, but you'll see that I'm drawing the edges around things manually. So I'm not using a fill method. I'm not punching a, a vector out of those lines. I'm redrawing the lines manually so that we don't have to trim between everything. And I actually did more trimming on, the next, on this next piece than I did in the original but you'll see there's a couple of trims where you have to jump into places that you can't get out of. Otherwise, I'm drawing a line out and back and returning to a central area so that I can only draw these things once if I want to. So I was a little more production minded on this one than I was on the modern one, honestly. But you'll see that I'm just drawing these out. So I'm really, I'm starting from a point, I'm drawing till I hit a line where I can travel to somewhere else, drawing out, back to my travel line and back. And on this one, a lot of the travel was done on the edges of the letters. And then at the end of it, I'm running an outline around the edge of the letters. And like I said, I wasn't lying whatsoever. We didn't have any sort of curved lines that I could use. So you'll see that there are some real rough, rough areas in this piece. So absolutely, that's what the original design looked like. And let's go ahead and bring up the new design now, right? This is the new design. So this is what it looks like in the final piece. And what I, like I said before, same kind of process, just a little more regular. And how did I decide these quote unquote densities? The densities was to measure the piece that I liked originally and then alter the way that I did it. It's similar to the original piece, but it's not exact. And it just follows the same design you does. How do I apply it? If the stitches are this far apart in the original design in the way that I like them, I'm gonna make sure that those lines of stitching are that far apart in the new design. And also I'm gonna look at that sequence. Let's say that this wasn't my original design. I'm gonna say, all right, well, I drew up and then drew back down. Okay, well, this stripe is not connected to anything. So I'm just gonna go ahead and draw and go back down. This one up and back down, up and back down, same thing here. Where it's connected, I'll connect it if I can. And this one I had more trims because I allowed for there to be trimming instead of running around the outside edges. Uh, on the original piece, you could see some of the travel even after you finished the final cover, quote unquote cover stitching, the thicker stitching around the letters. Uh, because we didn't want that on this piece, I let them trim. But you can still see same thing, up and back, up and back, right? Nothing, nothing all that crazy. These are all straight lines, except for whenever I hit a void, I actually drew up into the void and then back down. So you can see the sequence again. Same thing on each of these pieces, up and back down, so that every line has exactly two stitches, uh, two lines stitching on top of each other, and no more. And that's it. So that's how the design went. And then the one big difference that actually added a lot of stitches, but I think looked quite nice. On this piece, instead of just running another set of, of double stitches around the lettering, I actually ran a back stitch. So this has a nice thick back stitch around it instead. But that's the thing. I altered one thing about that stitching I didn't like. So what did I do? I did my own project that mirrored the project I was looking at, but then I altered the one thing that I wanted to change about the project. So that's what I did. That's how this works. You measure, you implement it in a new design, in a design that you've done before, and you work with it that way. So that's the thing. When we're talking about applying the things we've learned, let's go back and kind of cover that. As we're into bonus time, let's go ahead and cover that one more time. What are the things that we wanted to learn? How are we doing this application? So what did we want out of this, guys, right? First thing is uh, we wanted to talk about what we can see. When we're looking at doing analysis, we're talking about what we can see. Look at the design. Think about what you can see from the face of it. Are there different angles? Is an area of color broken up into more than one shape, more than one object you would have to draw in your software to replicate it? Uh, what are the angles that you can see there? What is the texture like? Is it even or rough? Uh, what are the stitch lengths like? Are they long or short? And how does that make the design look? What types of stitches are used in what area? Do we have satins here? Do we have fill stitches here? Are we, are we looking to fill an area with overlapped satin stitches? Do we have motif stitches? Do we have a curved fill versus a straight fill? Well, these are things we can see from a sample immediately. We can analyze and say, this is part of what makes the sample look the way it looks. The second thing is what we can measure. How far do they overlap? 
what is the stitch length? What is the density? Can I measure that? If I have the file in hand and I can look at it in software, I can go, how far is the overlap? What is the inset? How far inset from the edge is the underlay if there's a contour underlay on an object? What kind of density uh, do we have in the underlay? What kind of angles are there in the underlay versus the top stitching? These are things we can measure and we can see that stuff when we're inside the file. We also can measure the difference between the file and the actual stitch piece if we run it out. We, we run out the file and we can actually see the stitch piece has measurements like this. It actually runs like this on this particular material and stabilizer combination. Uh, swatch testing, we then, we, what can we do with our settings? We can make little swatches. We say, okay, the fill stitch in this design that I love has a length like this, an angle like this, and it has this kind of uh, spacing. Well, we're gonna go ahead and put that all together and say this kind of density, this kind of uh, pattern as well. Make little swatches of that design, say, okay, does it look like the fill that I love or not? And change one thing across the swatches, alter that one thing so we can figure out what we can get, what kind of different effects we can get out of changing that one setting in that fill type, right? Or in that stitch type. So swatch testing is like that. Then we have combination testing that we can do. I wanna look at in a design how we had, let's say overlaps. These two satins are overlapped this amount. What if I make swatches of different amounts of overlap? This is just a little bit of overlap, then more, then more, then more. And we see where does it break apart? Where do I end up that it doesn't register anymore on this material, on this stabilizer? And then we can see how much overlap do we need in order for these two satin stitches to stay together. And we can do that with borders. We can do combinations. So it's a com combination of satin stitch with a straight stitch border, fill stitch with a straight stitch border, fill stitch with a satin stitch border. And we keep going through those combinations as they make logical sense and look at how they interact. What about stitch angles? Keep altering a stitch angle on one piece that's underneath or on top of another piece and look how they interact. How do they fall together? What changes with density when we do different types of underlay across a set of swatches? Or we can do combinations of different underlay and fill types. We can do that. We can do combinations of different satin or fill stitches together in different angles. Combination testing is like that. The other kind is we can do combinations of materials and stabilizers with stitches on top. And we look at what those different combinations of materials and stabilizers do. That's that kind of testing. Then we have design testing. Take the settings that you see and apply them to similar stitch types in your own creation, but make it something that's a little bit different so you can see how it behaves. And I'll say there are some things like stitch patterns and stitch values that are different when we have different shapes. So checking that against a different shape is a good way to handle it. Make a similar design to the design you love, and apply those settings within each one of the stitch types to see how it works. Apply the same combinations too. Look at how it's put together, try and replicate it to the best of your ability. Alteration, take that design you love and alter one element of it and track, know how you altered it so that when you look at it, you can say, when I altered this setting, when I altered this interaction between stitches, this is what it does to it. And what we're aiming for out of all of this, we're aiming to understand the essence. We want to know what the essence of the stitch is. And that is, how do stitches deform on materials? How do they deform differently on different materials? What's the difference when they interact at different angles? And when different stitch types are put with each other on top of each other, next to each other, what do they do? And also, think about this when you talk about overall how a design runs. How do these stresses form up as a design runs in sequence? So think about that too. And the, what this really leads to is what I like to call stitch consciousness. It's where you develop. We talked about last week developing the eye for embroidery. This is developing the mind for embroidery as well. This is where not only can you see a design and say, these types of stitches would work well in this design, in this shape that I'm trying to fill, but these stitches will interact in this way on the material I want to. And I know that before I get there. I know that before I get to the actual stitch out so that when I'm creating my design in my mind, I already know the deformation it's going to undergo and I can draw the shapes that I need to draw to get the shapes I want to turn out on the machine. So that, this is the circles to ovals, folks. I know that I want to draw the oval so that I can get the circle when the stresses are put on the design. So with that, guys, I guess we're gonna finish up. But what I'm going to do is go ahead and do a couple last comments here. I'm going to uh, go ahead and grab just a couple things I think you guys are going to like. Uh, first thing is that design that I just showed you, 
that is something that's actually on our Brilliance Projects blog right now. There's also a couple of other free designs that I've got, but I'll go ahead and I'm going to show you that design one more time. I'm going to show you the, the link one more time over at Brilliance, and I'm going to drop this link into the comments if you want to get it. Let's go ahead and bring this back up again. Actually, let's go ahead and, and uh, change the screen over so you can see what I'm looking at. I have to change this over. You can only share one type of screen at one time, folks, so I'm going to go ahead and show this to you again. We're going to share uh, this tab for you so you can take a look at it over on the Brilliance Project blog right now. If you want to go grab it, you can download this design and use it for free. Uh, this is something where it's in the original file, so you'll be able to download the free version of Brilliance, run the express mode, or if you're an Brilliance user, you can use it and actually tweak it. If you've got Stitch Artist, it's the original working file, and uh, with the original working file, as I've taught you for uh, other reasons, that original working file is going to allow you to make changes to the individual pieces that are there and alter it and make it your own. You can change the size, you can change whatever you want to, you can rescale, change stitch types, whatever you want to do if you have a if you have Stitch Artist. So if you don't have Stitch Artist, great, go get the free mode, save it out to a DST file, measure it, run it, play with it, whatever you want to do. And honestly, make yourself something cool for 4th of July if you like the design. And uh, hey, share it with me on social media, share it, tag it. Uh, with my name tag and brilliance in so they can see it too and that's something that you can do so go ahead and check that out in the comments you'll go ahead and get that link i would love for you guys to go ahead and get that uh the other thing i've done and i'll go ahead and show this because it's also on the project blog here might as well as we're in bonus time if you guys missed this out last year i shared this is another one of my designs that i resurrected for everybody it's a, a vintage felt patch that's made with this kind of Americana theme. It's Statue of Liberty that I've done. When I talk about black work and uh, doing engraving style work, uh, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about, folks. That's that engraving style work we're talking about. And it was done for a patch, but this is the actual piece. Uh, so it's a Statue of Liberty patch that I drew out to, and that's something else you can get today if you want to over on the blog. So if you want this one, I'll go ahead and stick the link one more time in the comments. But you can go to the Brilliance Project blog, and you'll be able to get both of those today if you want to. So like I said, whenever I tell you guys to analyze designs, one of the sets of designs I'm hoping you'll analyze is mine, folks. So uh, analyze my designs if you want to. And actually, I, thought, I said I would bring this up, so last bonus time thing I can do, right? Let's bring up one more thing, since I since I'm I'm always about doing some embroidery, you know, some embroidery bonus time for you folks. I'm going to do one more link if I can, uh, and that's this one. I s swore to Jeff that I would share it since we talked about it earlier, but let's go ahead and bring this screen back up one more time. Uh, and this is the other one that I'm looking for. Uh, we actually have uh, this piece. We're going to go ahead and share this other this other design here. And it's we talked about my shirt being the same shirt that I had repaired before. Uh, and it looks very much like it. I have this piece on uh, MrXStitch.com and it's something that I, you know, that I like to show you guys. Let's let's see if I can bring this up as well. Having a couple technical problems with uh, <laughs> with my Chrome tab right now. So I apologize for that, folks. Let's go ahead and bring this up. Here's the tab I was looking for. Uh, I'll go ahead and put myself in the screen on it. But this piece is a uh, and that's what I was trying not to do is have ads pop up. MrXStitch.com, and the, the article was called Make, Do, and Monogram or Repair with Embroidery. And yes, this shirt looks very similar to the shirt that we have there. And this is one of my first pieces I ever digitized in Embroidery Stitch Artist, actually. And this was, I had a favorite shirt that got a tear in it. And um, in this design, I went ahead and made this light running kind of light loose fill with an underlay on it to knock down and flatten out the big tear that I put in my uh, shirt. And then I ran a very light stitching monogram on top of it. And I've actually used this to show people. I talked about all these cool things I do. Sometimes these cool designs where I'm like doing all these blending and stuff. I really like this kind of design, this simple uh, black on black. And uh, if, if you're in the car club kind of community, this is, for my friends call it a murdered out design because it's all black, like an all black paint job on a car. Uh, but this is the thing. I had to tear in my shirt and repaired it. What I am going to show you guys, though, is that this actual piece, I put the, I'll put this link out for you to see it as well. This has me discussing how I took the design, went to some art source online, got some classic art source and put it together. And what it shows as well as all that is how I built up the strokes that you get the proper over and under overlapping of the lettering, even though it looks like it's something that wouldn't be done with a single object. I'm always telling you guys, you don't have to fill one area with a single object. This actually talks about that. And it's very much like when we talked about caps a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about how the sequence uh, to sequence uh, lettering that has like tails in it, script lettering from right to left causes some issues. Same thing here. And I played you guys out on this piece. It's actually the sequence of the run that is on video in this piece. And I always like to show you guys run sequences. So this is one of those things that's fun. Uh, since we discussed it on, on stream today, I'll go ahead and put that in the link as well. But yeah, one of my first pieces I ever did in Stitch Artist, and I really love sharing that one. 
But anyway, I don't want to have ads and junk on it. So we'll go ahead and move that out of out of the uh, screen right now. But if you want to check that out, we'll go ahead and put that in the comments as well. The thing to remember about this is watching sequence is as important as measuring and watching other things. Watching sequence is also how we manage to get things put together. So go ahead and check that out if you want to also. Like I said, when we're looking at what we want to understand about things, we're trying to get to stitch consciousness. We want to look, see what we can observe measure what we can from the files, measure the actual piece and the differences between the two. And we want to see things in sequence, in stitches. We get the eye for embroidery, we prepare our mind for embroidery, and we start to understand the translation between what's on screen that's lying to us and what's the real product of what we do, which are the stitches, which is the real embroidery. So get out there, guys. Understand the essence. <laughs> Aim for that. Develop stitch consciousness. And with that, I'm going to let you go. And I hope you have a wonderful Independence Day in the U.S. Uh, everywhere else, I just hope you have a wonderful weekend. And I cannot wait to see you guys again.